I would like to welcome you to the October Ag Sector Council webinar titled, How Can Enabling Environment Reform Facilitate Agricultural Sector Growth? The monthly Ag Sector Council seminar series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I'll be facilitating the webinar today, so you will see my name in the chat box pretty often and hear my voice during the Q&A session after the presentations. We're excited to have a great lineup of speakers online today to discuss several analyses of Feed the Future's work towards reducing legal, regulatory, and institutional barriers to agricultural growth in developing countries. But before we get started with the content, I would just like to provide a few reminders and kind of housekeeping issues. First, the chat box is your main way to communicate today. So thanks to everyone who has introduced yourselves in the chat box. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these events. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, to share links and resources, and to ask questions about the presentations that we'll pose to our speakers in the second half of the webinar today. So we'll be collecting your questions throughout and asking them once the presentations are finished. Next, today's presentation is available to download on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. Uh, so you'll see some resources on the left. You can click on uh, the event page link there and uh, download the presentation. We'll also have that available later in the webinar on your screen. And we are recording this webinar and we'll post the recording, the transcript, and other resources to AgriLinks uh, within a week or two. If you're watching the webinar right now, that means you're already on the email list to receive a link to the recording. So keep your eye on your email, and we'll make sure you have uh, the recording of this so you can share it with your colleagues or, or review any of the content. If you're having any technical issues, please start a private chat with the AV Tech, uh, who you'll see at the top of the attendees pod there. You can hover over his name and start a private chat, or just let us know if you're having technical issues in the chat box, and we'll do our best to help you out. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into our discussion of the agricultural enabling environment. To give us an intro to the topic and to our speakers, I would like to introduce Kelly Cormier. Kelly is an agricultural economist and oversees inclusive market development uh, with the Bureau for Food Security's Office of Market Partnerships. And so I'll pass the mic to Kelly for a brief introduction and she'll introduce our speakers. Thank you, Julie. I'm happy to kick us off today. And I will introduce our speakers in just a minute, but first I wanted to provide uh, a brief, some brief context. Since the beginning of the initiative, Feed the Future has acknowledged the important role of a sound enabling environment to achieving inclusive ag sector growth and improved nutritional status. Uh, we do this through facilitation of more predictable market linkages along key value chains, to increase domestic and cross-border trade, or new public and private investments in agricultural technology and market infrastructure, for example. And while many of you are familiar with the term enabling environment, I want to be clear that we have used a broad definition of the enabling environment to include the complex set of laws, regulations, and institutions, both the formal and informal rules, that shape behavior within markets for production, trade, and consumption of agricultural goods and services. This is deliberately broad, and we've hypothesized that the enabling environment heavily influences the long-term success and sustainability of gains in food security achieved under Feed the Future. The analyses that we'll learn about today were motivated in part by an interest in testing this hypothesis and expanding the evidence base on the role and practice of enabling environment changes in achieving sustainable improvements in food security and nutrition. So first, Amy Chambers and Megan Murphy with the Feed the Future Enabling Environment for Food Security Project will share findings of a review of enabling environment reform investments in order to catalog what has been done, what's working, and what lessons have been learned that can help identify technical gaps and improve technical coherence across project activities. Next, and similarly, we will hear from Justin Lawrence and Gwen Varley of the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, who will share enabling environment related findings from Feed the Future monitoring and evaluation data sources. So now I'll briefly introduce our speakers and then we'll get started with the presentations. 
First, uh, Amy Chambers. Um, Amy is a legal, regulatory, and institutional reform specialist. She's currently the deputy chief of party for the Feed the Future Enabling Environment for Food Security Project, which was launched in late 2015 uh, to address policies, laws, institutions, and regulatory factors affecting agriculture and food security outcomes. Megan Murphy, um, also with the Feed the Future Enabling Environment for Food Security Project, leads the knowledge management activities um, under the project. Justin Lawrence is a monitoring and evaluation professional with the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. He um, currently serves as Assessing and Learning Portfolio Manager. And finally, Gwen Varley is a Qualitative Research Specialist for the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, where she provides analysis of monitoring and evaluation data across Feed the Future activities. Now, Amy, over to you. I want to take a step back and point the tail. Um, what do we mean by the enabling environment? And, and why does it matter? Um, Kelly touched on this um, in her opening remarks. Um, but I think given, uh, just to frame the discussion, it bears going into a little more detail. So first of all, the, the enabling environment for food security encompasses all of the policies, laws, regulations, and institutions that govern the behavior of actors throughout a market system. Um, from the regulation of agricultural research and inputs all the way to the quality standards that are imposed on final products in a supermarket. Basically, what we're talking about is the rules of the game, uh, whether we're talking about formal laws and regulations on the books or the more informal uh, and customary, often unwritten norms uh, that can influence what actually happens in practice. Uh, the market system, as you can see from the, the diagram on your screen, is made up of interactions across a vast number of interconnected players well beyond the farm gate, from input suppliers all the way to the final consumer. And the enabling environment constraints faced by these different actors can have important impacts on agricultural sector growth, um, both the rate of growth and also who benefits. Uh, the cumulative transaction costs that occur over the course of the, the, the value chain can add up to, into, to overall costs that reduce uh, investments in the sector and, and the total amount of wealth generated. And then the structure and content of those rules matters as well. It can either empower or limit smallholders, women, and other disadvantaged groups. It can stimulate vibrant competition, or it can protect narrow self-interest at the expense of food security. What the rules say and, what the, and how the norms operate and how they are applied is central to achieving inclusive agricultural sector growth. And finally, the enabling environment matters because it impacts the sustainability of reforms. Uh, systems, norms, and behavior are hard to change. Even changing a regulation, as, as some of you may know from experience, can be a long and cumbersome process. But without addressing these system, systemic enabling environment constraints, other gains in other areas, such as productivity, uh, may not be sustainable uh, when program funds end. So the Enabling Environment for Food Security Project uh, was uh, launched in late 2015 by the Bureau for Food Security's Office of Markets and Partnerships Innovation um, in recognition of the importance of the enabling environment to achieving Food the Future goals. Uh, the project's objectives are to provide technical support to missions in enacting on the ground reforms, and, and also to build the evidence base of uh, good practice in uh, enabling environment reform. So we have not only a focus on the design and implementation of reforms on the ground, but also a strong knowledge management component to support learning across the agency and the broader development community. Um, that, is, that component is part of what led to this review that we're here to talk about today. Um, and our knowledge management officer for the project, Megan Murphy, is here with me today and will be responding to your questions as we go in the chat box and um, later participating in the Q&A. So welcome, Megan. So the review we're here to talk about today was one we conducted in the late spring and early summer of this year, uh, where we evaluated Feed the Future investments in enabling environment reform over the past five years. Our objective was to catalog what has been done, uh, to analyze the results, 
and to identify common constraints and lessons learned that can inform future programming. This required us to uh, not only identify all the projects and investments with enabling environment component, um, but also to find out on what activities were actually conducted um, and what was accomplished. And then to synthesize that information into different categories of investment to be able to, to distill common constraints and lessons learned. Um, this had the potential to be an absolutely massive undertaking. Um, and it, it still was, but given the limited time and resources, um, we wanted to make sure we could accomplish our objective uh, without going completely overboard. So we set out some basic parameters to define the, the scope of the analysis. Um, first of all, we had to define enabling environment for food security. Um, the, we, we, as Kelly said before, we define this relatively broadly um, to include um, all laws, regulations, and institutions, both formal and formal, uh, informal, that shape market behavior related to the production, trade, and consumption of agricultural goods and services. Um, so while we included projects that had government engagement in the areas of food safety, nutrition, resiliency, and, and climate smart agriculture, we uh, excluded general poverty reduction strategies such as social safety nets, even when those could have an impact on consumers' capacity to purchase. Um, the next thing we did is we looked at the source of funding. Um, as all of you know, Feed the Future is a whole of government initiative, um, but we that was considered to be just too broad, so we decided to focus our review on investments by USAID, and um, specifically those by USAID focus missions and uh, Feed the Future focus missions and the view for food security. Um, we were a lot more lenient on the project dates. We generally included any project that was implemented in whole or in part during the period of 2011 to 2015, or 2016. Um, we approached each mission portfolio sort of like a story, so we looked back at what was pre-existing when Feed the Future started, um, and we looked at the how the those projects and the new projects were incorporated into the multi-year strategy. And to some extent, we've also included recent um, recent projects that just got started, but mostly as a reference point for future readers of the report, so since there aren't um, very few of those actually reported results to share. And finally, we limited the geographic scope. Um, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, but I, I wanted to also note from the outset that we, for time and resource reasons, we had determined that this had to be a desk study. Um, so we were also limited in our review to publicly available resources. So you can see in that text box on data sources um, the types of resources that were available to us, uh, which we found through looking through the deck um, and through knowledge sharing platforms like, like AgriLinks. And of course, just through online research of specific projects and their, and their technical resources. And there's more on that in the report if you're dying to know all the details of how the methodology worked. Um, in terms of the geographic scope, uh, we quickly realized that we couldn't do every focus country. Um, so we chose a subset, and we chose them based on the level of Feed the Future funding or a known commitment to enabling environment activities. Um, while making sure that we included at least one bilateral mission and one regional mission from each of the five Feed the Future regions. Um, at the end of the day, our goal was to gather information that was representative of the breadth of enabling of act activities conducted and not to be 100% comprehensive across all of Feed the Future. And ultimately, I think we got a good representative sample of that. And then if we were to continue to do this, we it probably wouldn't have changed the categories and dimensions of the analysis. So in total, we reviewed more than 240 investments across seven bilateral missions, five regional missions in the Bureau for Food Security. Um, of those, 103 were found to have an enabling environment component. Um, in looking back, we, we went all the way back to looking at the how policy reform was incorporated into the Feed the Future framework, um, how it impacted focus country selection, the sele selection process for, for focus countries, and uh, we found that enabling environment reform and policy reform were an integral component of all the, the multi-year strategies for all of the missions selected. In practice, um, six of the seven bilateral missions and all five regional missions had invested in one or more dedicated policy reform projects. And then when we look at res results, it became a little more challenging. Uh, we have 
Feed the Future monitoring uh, system reporting data for policy reform indicators, which can offer us sort of an initial insight into um, the, the pattern of investment in these reforms. Um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And so the qualitative analysis we did, looking at um, ap actual project documents and reports, uh, was much more time consuming, but revealed allowed us to gather and re reveal the uh, common challenges. We divided the analysis into uh, three different dimensions. Uh, first, we looked at the programming structure. So what were the differences between how missions and, and the Bureau for Food Security approached enabling environment reform? Um, second, we looked at the methods of engagement. So how specifically did USAID staff and implementing partners engage in these efforts? And lastly, we looked at priority policy areas. What were the main issues that rose to the top um, and why? In terms of programming uh, structure, um, in the end, we saw that uh, the enabling environment and its impacts on markets from farm to export have featured heavily in Feed the Future programming from dedicated agricultural policy projects to micro-level policy interventions as part of broader value chain programs. Uh, while we found that pretty much every mission and every office within the Bureau of Food Security had a dedicated policy reform project, um, at, the, uh, at the bilateral mission level, enabling environment activities were often wrapped into value chain projects, uh, ranging from dairy in Rwanda and Kenya, um, horticulture, and then mango and aquaculture in Bang Bangladesh, so a wide range of, uh, of sectors, subsectors. Uh, at the regional level, it's what you might expect. Um, there's a lot of focus on regional harmonization, um, which required a, a high level of regional analysis to support those efforts. And then the Bureau for Food Security focuses at a, at a more uh, high level um, and more global focus, um, including mission, mission support programs such as the Enabling Environment for Food Security Project and its predecessor project, the, e the Enabling Agricultural Trade or EAT project, um, which are demand-driven mechanisms that can cover a wide range of topics. And, um, and to support for agricultural research programs through U.S. land-grant universities, CGIR centers, and managing multi-donor initiatives such as the CADIP multi-donor um, trust fund and um, funding other entities such as AGRA, as well as uh, facilitating public-private partnerships such as the Global Development Alliance and the Grand Challenges for Development uh, and the New Alliance. So the methods of, en of engagement looks at the me mechanics of what was done. What were the activities undertaken and what were the roles of um, the donor and the implementing partner in, in accomplishing these goals. Um, when we looked across what was done, we came up with six main categories or methods of engagement um, that were undertaken. Um, the first is, is looking at technical analysis. So this is providing um, expert reviews to provide input into public dialogue, um, into the design and or, or, or monitoring of um, policy reforms. Um, and technical analysis has also been used as an advocacy tool. So, for example, the West Africa Agribusiness and Trade Promotion Program um, successfully lobbied to lift a four-year ban on poultry trade in Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso by providing a cost-benefit analysis of the negative effects of those bans. And the technical analysis often yields recommendations that can lead directly into um, opportunities for technical assistance, such as embedded advisors and ministries, um, or capacity building training for uh, ministries, private sector, and civil society, um, sometimes in the form of things like study tours. Um, within ministries, a lot of the capacity building focuses on issues of budgeting, management, and, and data systems. Um, and then the other role that, that donors and their implementing partners often play is um, in, in bringing people together, um, so convening stakeholders either through uh, one-off roundtables and focus groups or by building sustainable public-private mechanisms and uh, networks for ongoing policy reform engagement. And so, for example, in Kenya, the Dairy Sector Competitiveness Program established a national dairy task force. Um, and these have also been used to coordinate on regional initiatives, such as the East Africa Compete Project uh, that was able to uh, organize joint border inspections by the customs agencies from a variety of countries um, as a, a precursor to introducing a single customs window in the region. 
um, public-private partnerships have been both large-scale, such as the new, new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, um, and also small-scale local programs. For example, in Rwanda, the private sector-driven agricultural growth project um, issued value chain competitiveness grants to promote innovative um, value chain solutions for, for certain focused commodities. And lastly, uh, the, there's been a lot of engagement in the area of advocacy, diplomacy, and communications. And this can be anything from participating in parliamentary discussions and donor working groups um, to policy papers and conducting um, communications and awareness campaigns. The final dimension of our analysis was activities and accomplishments related to specific areas of the uh, enabling environment. Um, the priority policy areas covered quite a few. Uh, I'm not going to go into them all today, but uh, you can see the list there and find uh, more detail on all of these in the final report. One of the core areas was the agricultural policymaking process itself. Um, this is a macro level examination of the processes and processes and capacity needed to formulate and execute good policy for agriculture and food security, including uh, evidence-based policymaking, public-private dialogue, and effective monitoring of policy impl implementation. Um, so in Bangladesh, the Policy Research and Strategy Support Program uh, was able to assist in establishing a policy support unit within the Ministry of Agriculture. And in Guatemala, the Policy and Regulatory Support for Economic Growth Project provided support for the Food Security and Nutrition Secretariats in Guatemala, and provided advocacy training for civil society groups. On a more micro level, projects have engaged in specific policy areas to, in response to specific needs. So for example, the Kenya TAPRA II project um, conducted policy research and held stakeholder workshops on a variety of topics as needs arose, um, such as on fertilizer policy, um, value-added tax and excise taxes, and policies around genetically modified food. There's been a tremendous amount of effort in building a robust private sector-driven input sector um, throughout all of the Feed the Future countries, uh, a sector capable of providing high-level, high-quality inputs to smallholder farmers at an affordable cost. Um, the challenge with this, these efforts is, is that in most countries, this often meant tackling what was traditionally a government-controlled ind industry and transitioning it to a, uh, what was often a nascent private sector in a, in a sustainable fashion. Um, to support this, uh, projects have engaged in research on the, inputs, uh, the impact of in input subsidy programs to encourage phasing these programs out. Um, there's been a lot of effort in private sector development through privatization of the inputs industries um, providing investment incentives and lowering investment costs and the regulatory burdens that limit entry uh, of new, new seed companies, for example. And as the private sector develops, projects also focused on transitioning the government's role um, to one of strengthening quality and enforcement of existing regulations um, to promote uh, competition and um, good quality in the market. So for example, the Uganda Ag Inputs uh, Project focused on supply chain management to tackle um, the prevalence of counterfeit inputs uh, in that country. And there has also been a heavy focus on regional harmonization of input policies to lower the costs of and on the obstacles of cross border trade and in inputs. Um, this can be, include both enabling regional commitments um, and getting those passed and also looking at how to domesticate or how to get those regional com uh, commitments implemented on the ground in each of the member countries through things like national pest lists and regional um, seed variety catalogs. And regional harmonization and facilitating the open flow of goods across borders was also a strong area of engagement for both inputs and output markets. Um, a lot of, there was a lot of focus on cross-border trade and regional trade in, in particular. Um, these activities often centered on trade facilitation reforms. Um, so for example, the Ghana Trade and Investment Program uh, for a Competitive Export Economy Project. Um, it's an alphabet soup. I'm, I'm reading out all the names of the projects here, but that, recognize that, that they are, they are, I recognize that they are very long. Um, so the Ghana, uh, I think it's called the TIPSI Program, embedded an advisor within the Ministry of Trade and Agriculture to help facilitate trade facilitation reforms. 
And um, across the globe in multiple regions, there was a strong focus on um, putting in practice one of the more well-known good practices, um, which is initiating a custom single window. Um, this occurred in East Africa with the support of the Compete Project. Um, the regional mission in Asia um, had, uh, did a similar one for ASEAN, um, and also within the mission for Central America and, and Mexico. And uh, lastly, there's a focus on in the regional uh, and, and cross-border trade on compliance with global regional trade commitments. Um, so for example, the uh, RDMA focused on capacity building for both the APEC and ASEAN secretariats. So looking across all of these investments, um, certain common challenges emerged as themes. And studying these in a little more depth could help us to design more effective programs going forward. Um, one of the main ones that projects cited was a challenge in generating widespread stakeholder buy-in for reform. Projects have often suffered when government officials have lacked time or had different differing priorities. Um, this can happen when, for example, parliament is in session or during an election cycle when the, the, the focus of the government officials that are the necessary partners in these reforms shifts. Um, projects have solved this in part by trying to align their activities with government planning cycles and uh, national strategic plans. Projects also emphasize the importance of strong communication at project startup, uh, both to improve coordination going forward and to, to build trust with, uh, with government counterparts as a show of respect. Uh, and buy-in comes not just from local stakeholders, but also between uh, development, part development partners, so including, uh, including other donors, um, between projects, and also even within U.S. government entities, so USAID missions and embassies um, within regions, each of whom often has its own agenda, um, but all of whom could benefit from working more closely together. So even where there is political will and, uh, and a stakeholder buy-in into, into policy reform, these reforms can be undermined where there's a lack of sufficient resources and capacity for policy reform formulation and implementation. So multiple site projects cited a lack of reliable agricultural sector, sector data um, and complicated policy reform procedures as an obstacle to achieving their reform objectives. Uh, delays have also been caused when there are too few resources for implementation, either due to a lack of trained staff or high staff turnover or insufficient budget allocations to the necessary ministry. Um, this can be particularly acute when, in rural areas uh, where there is either uh, a low government presence or, or even where power has been decentralized to the local government. Um, projects have often found that government to be poorly equipped. Building trust and buy-in requires clear communication from the outset, as we mentioned before. Um, some projects have struggled to gain traction uh, where the project itself lacked a clear scope and performance indicator, uh, indicators, um, or where the project suffered from high staff turn turnover that can lead to stalling of policy reform objectives midstream. Um, in other cases, the scope may be clear, uh, but it may be just too rigid to adapt to evolving priorities on the ground, and there's a need for uh, greater flexibility in program design to allow projects such as the Kenya Tapper project that I mentioned before um, to, be, to be able to engage as needs arise in, in specific policy issues. And finally, while uh, working through local partners has strong benefits in terms of sustainability, um, we need to recognize that these partners may need capacity building at the outset and build that into our program objectives, recognizing that, um, that, that achieving that means also we may need to revise down policy targets in the early years of the project. And ultimately, uh, the policy reform has to be driven by local ownership and advocacy, um, both to ensure its legitimacy and to ensure its sustainability. Uh, achieving traction among key constituencies, such as government officials, and, and facilitating these reforms all the way from um, formulation through implement, implementation takes a lot of time. Um, it can easily be thrown off by elections, um, the appointment of a new minister um, that suddenly stalls ongoing efforts, um, and an even greater political upheaval than that. 
Um, and in the typical three to five year project timeline, it's simply it's nearly impossible uh, to advance through all of these different stages um, of, of policy reform. Um, unfortunately, this has often led projects to either focus on quick wins instead of laying the groundwork for more systemic reforms, or, or to avoid policy targets altogether. Um, there were some projects that reported um, dropping their policy components in favor of productivity activities, um, or at a minimum, dropping the reporting on policy indicators, um, which under the um, Feed the Future monitoring evaluation framework have been uh, not, not mandatory indicators. Um, but, but declining to report on those indicators and targets um, in favor of other targets that are easier to show impact on. Um, obviously, this is a challenge for us at the, at the back end, uh, such as now when we're trying to show what kinds of impacts have been done. Um, and it also, uh, d it, we lose a, a, a critical opportunity to really track what's being accomplished. So what has been accomplished? Um, so over uh, across all of the Feed the Future Focus and Align countries, um, the Feed the Future monitoring system recorded more than 4,500 policies, laws, and regulations and administrative procedures that passed through one of at least uh, at least one of five stages of policy reform um, during the period of 2011 to 2015. Um, the table on the screen shows uh, the cumulative data reported across all these projects. Um, on the relative, relevant um, policy reform indicators. Um, these, these, measure, uh, the five, the, like, these measure the five stages of policy reform, um, which includes everything from technical analysis to stakeholder dialogue, the technical drafting of laws and uh, regulations, um, through the approval of new laws, and then their ultimate implementation. Um, you see three different uh, indicators on the screen in the table. Um, the first one is the main policy reform indicator. Uh, there are two of them largely because it was slightly refined, the text was slightly refined in 2013. Um, so there are numbers for both versions for 2014 and 15. And then in um, 2013 there was also introduced a, uh, a an indicator specific to regional missions to help to better capture um, the stages of policy reform in terms of um, implementation of regional initiatives. Um, so by themselves, um, these numbers don't tell us a lot. Um, they do show us a steady increase in engagement and progress um, on policy reform activities, um, but they don't really tell us the whole story uh, of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, in just a little bit, I'm going to turn things over to Justin, who's going to talk a, a, a bit more about some of the more detailed da data that's contained in the performance narratives that accompany these, these, um, these numbers. Uh, but for our purposes here, they, they don't really tell us exactly what happened. Um, there are also out there custom indicators that each project comes up with um, to track their, their, um, their activities. So for example, in a policy reform project, that might include um, the number of seminars and trainings conducted, the number of policy papers drafted. Um, there, there is a lot of interesting data to be called from, from those custom indicators, um, but because they do not feed into the Feed the Future monitoring system, it will take a, a lot more time and effort to compile all of that uh, information. Um, so in order to get a clearer picture, uh, we had to dig deeper into qualitative reports of what was actually done um, by the projects. So these include the annual and final reports for different projects, as well as um, technical publications and press releases um, and policy papers that show the actual activities conducted. These are necessarily more anecdotal and, and harder to track down, um, but they contain a lot of the best information out there to support whether what we're doing is actually um, working. So to give you a, a few examples, um, from the perspective of programming and structure, we found evidence that both the dedicated policy projects and the value chain projects that incorporate an enabling environment component are both effective just uh, in, in different ways. Um, the value chain projects can build trust, they have the longevity and the relationships necessary to engage in longer term policy dialogue processes that can yield re results in specific sectors. Um, so for example, um, technical support through Feed the Future projects. 
uh, assisted in the enactment of 22 dairy sector policies and standards in Kenya and new warehouse receipt systems through Mozambique, Kenya, and Ghana. Um, and then the dedicated policy projects uh, also have benefits in terms of, of working closely with policymakers across the ag sector policymaking process. And so where there is political will, they have the ability to accomplish some significant institutional and structural reforms. Um, so for example, um, the policy reform activities led to the creation of a dedicated agricultural policy support unit in the Bangladesh Ministry of Agriculture. Um, in Rwanda, the PREFER project was able to shepherd through the privatization of the fertilizer industry. Um, and the Tanzania SARA project, um, through a policy brief and uh, evidence of the impact of a maize export ban, was able to convince the government of Tanzania to lift that ban. Uh, through its own investments, the Bureau for Food Security has made significant contributions to building analytical tools and data sets and um, starting new innovative um, new partnership models to better leverage our resources in enabling environment reform. Um, so over the course of the past five years, USAID has made substantial investments um, specifically in benchmarking the enabling env uh, environment for agriculture. Um, this includes indexes such as the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, um, the Agribusiness Regulation and in Institutions, or AGRI Index, um, and also support for the development of the World Bank's Enabling the Business of Agriculture uh, Index. So benchmarking measures the time, cost, and procedures um, of, uh, of agricultural um, or enabling environment um, re uh, regulations. Um, this can provide a snapshot of both the quality of the laws and regulations um, against global good practice um, and can also show the impact of the enabling environment um, on the private sector rather than just what is actually in the laws on the books. Um, benchmarking can also be a powerful tool for generating momentum and uh, for reform and providing transparency and monitoring the, the progress of those reforms. Um, and uh, However, it's important to notice that the um, that benchmarking does not provide the whole story. Um, it, like I said, it provides a snapshot. Um, and so it can point to symptoms, um, but we, will st we still need to provide a more detailed root cause analysis uh, in order to fully understand uh, the full context and how to address systemic constraints. Um, and USAID, through the Bureau for Food Security, also facilitated new public-private partnership models, such as the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which has to date, or at least to date as of spring or summer of 2016, leveraged $1.8 billion in private investment in support of the Feed the Future. Um, so looking forward, uh, at the end of the day, this review gave us a broad understanding of the work that's been done. Uh, what has been successful and where the, the key challenges are. So as we turn our focus forward and begin to design new programs, uh, particularly in light of the new global food security strategy, uh, these results point us towards a new list of questions and a variety of areas for further research. Uh, we are posing a few questions here, and I hope that we can discuss these later in the Q&A and, um, of course, through the chat box. So first of all, um, how can we do a better job of tracking data and results in enabling environment reform? Um, we, we pose this from the point of view of both quantitative tracking, and we talked a bit about what the indicators are that are in the Feed the Future monitoring framework, um, but also um, benchmarking um, as, a, as a new avenue for, for measuring our progress on, on enabling environment reform. Um, and ultimately, what we hope to see from enabling environment reform is impacts on high-level macroeconomic data. Um, however, that takes time, uh, a lot longer than you can really monitor in the project life cycle. Um, so in practice, we use the indicators that we've discussed today. Um, and then aside from the quantitative aspects of that, how can we do a better job of tracking our qualitative results? Um, Throughout the course of this review, we faced some significant challenges in actually identifying what was done. Um, we, we had not a whole lot of difficulty um, finding a summary of what the project set out to do. 
uh, but actual reporting uh, across what was done and, and data on what was accomplished, including that quantitative data, is, is very hard to find, um, either due to uh, lack of tracking it and, or, or lack of publishing that online um, or lack of complying with reporting requirements through the DEC. Um, so I think we can do a better job, but I'd be interested in hearing uh, what your thoughts are on that. And also, uh, what are the additional tools and types of analysis we need to understand these issues and design effective strategies refer for reform? Um, looking forward, there's a, a lot of new trends and new uh, areas we'll be moving into um, that haven't been covered by the, the work done in the previous um, five years. Um, so we'll be looking for new um, new analytical frameworks and tools for understanding things such as um, challenges of urbanization, um, youth and employment issues, and um, climate change and, and natural resource management. And finally, uh, what new approaches can help us to overcome some of the common challenges encountered in the past five years? Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Justin to give you a comparative perspective on, on the results they found from their review. Excellent. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, so Amy brought up a really good point, and I think it actually ties in very much into what we've been doing at KDAT over the past year. Um, how do we better keep track of our qualitative results of what the Feed the Future initiative has accomplished over the last five years? Um, and that's really what we set out to do um, about a year ago. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with um, the Feed the Future learning agenda, uh, which goes across six key areas. Um, productivity, research and development, markets, nutrition, gender, and resilience. Um, and we set out to actually look at um, the, the breadth of uh, performance evaluations and impact evaluations that were done across the Feed the Future initiative to help address these uh, learning agenda questions. Um, so in order to do that and to better track um, and, and be able to really keep track of all the knowledge that exists in these evaluations, we used a qualitative research software called Deduce. And what Deduce allowed us to do is to upload each of the um, 196 uh, performance evaluations that qualified as food security um, evaluations. We were able to load them all up, uh, and then we were able to uh, highlight excerpts, key passages that helped address certain learning agenda uh, questions and sub-questions. And then within those excerpts, we were allowed to apply codes um, that basically uh, would help categorize you know, certain interventions or certain um, outcomes or indicators that were being reflected in these passages. And what we amassed uh, throughout this process is we had over 5,000 uh, different excerpts that talked about uh, various learning agenda themes and questions. Um, so again, this is much more broad than sort of the enabling environment uh, specifics, but it's really looking across the Feed the Future initiative in terms of some of these key questions. Um, so for those of you that are you know, particularly familiar with the learning agenda, um, there isn't too much that's really referenced in terms of the enabling environment. But what we did find that very much corroborated um, you know, Amy's findings is that enabling environment, although not explicit within the learning agenda and not explicit um, you know, in, in some of these reporting, it was really, really present as a key factor. And one of um, one very basic example is for uh, under the realm of ag productivity, farmers might be able to you know grow a surplus um, and, and despite those gains without an enabling environment that allows for uh, those those uh, surpluses to actually get to market, um, then then really the true benefits are not real. So that's just one thing that we certainly saw across um, a variety of different ag products. Um, so the process of kind of categorizing and looking at you know the breadth of evaluations that were done across the feed um, was a really good process for us to go through and to help us actually be able to categorize learning across um, the, the feed. But it also left us to look at the other side of the coin is okay so great that's midterm evaluations that's final performance evaluations but what about this feed the future monitoring system? Um, and, and, you know, Amy had referred to this, that they pulled specific indicators out of this uh, database that were um, reporting on certain policy initiatives that were made. But 
what we did is is looking at each of these implementing mechanisms. Um, they also have to provide about a two-page summary um, about their their project's um, success over the past year. Um, and so it, what you're seeing on the slide here is exactly what the guidance is. is uh, every single Feed the Future mechanism gives a summary, uh, talks about their fiscal year performance, their successes, their challenges, and uh, expected activities. So with this format, we actually took a look across all of the, uh, over the past two fiscal years, every single mechanism and what were some of the common um, successes and challenges that they met, which you could probably imagine actually tells us quite a bit about the issue of the enabling environment because um, as, as we talked about earlier is, um, you know, so much of the progress that can happen across the enabling environment and across policy reform just really doesn't lend itself to quantitative uh, expression. So these narratives actually really did help us kind of understand policy and we very quickly realized that we need to flush out a pretty uh, ornate coding structure just to really get at the nuance of some of these policy measures that were being accomplished. Um, so looking across this project and, and looking across this, you know, the uh, looking at at all of our different monitoring data, it gave us a really uniform way of looking at uh, what Feed the Future was accomplishing. But the nice thing about being able to code it and, and have it archived is that we would be able to query it later on uh, to ask much more specific questions around the enabling environment. Um, and with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Gwen, who will talk a little bit about those outputs. Gwen? Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, so as Justin just mentioned, I'll be speaking uh, in a bit more detail about what we found uh, when we analyzed the performance narrative specifically for uh, our findings from two small investigations that we did, uh, one that was focused on trade uh, and the other that was focused on markets. Uh, so in neither of these did we explicitly focus on enabling environment, uh, as Justin was mentioning. However, Clearly, trade facilitation and strengthening markets are clearly important aspects of the enabling environment. And so when we looked at these topics, several of the themes and trends that appeared were very similar to what Megan and Amy found. Uh, so first, just some quick background on what questions these two analyses were trying to answer. Uh, for trade, uh, we were approached by an individual at USAID who was working on a report and who asked if we could search these performance narratives uh, for anything related to trade, particularly a list that they had of about 17 specific topics. And these range from SPS to tariffs to cross-border trade, and the, the full list is there on the slide. Uh, and this report was also focused specifically on regional missions, and so we only looked at the performance narratives from those missions. Uh, and then for the analysis on markets, uh, uh, on the other hand, this was, this was something of uh, an ongoing effort aiming to assist the preparations for uh, an upcoming event, sharing learning surrounding markets in the Feed the Future program. Uh, and the first question that we were trying to answer was simply what activities are out there related to markets? Uh, who is doing what and where? Uh, and secondly, the organizers of this event gave us a list of about 20 themes and questions that they wanted to address. And our job was to look for potential case study projects that focused on those particular themes. And, and I'll get back to the, the details on that in just a minute. Uh, but first, let's take a quick look at what we found for trade. Uh, and so for this, one of the simplest things that we did was just report uh, how often each of those 17 topics from the previous slide appeared in the performance narrative. Uh, and because of the nature of the coding process that Justin just described, uh, we were able to very quickly see quantitatively that, for example, uh, many, many more projects are addressing SDS and biosafety issues than are addressing land tenure. Um, and that's, uh, that's another finding that aligns very closely with what Megan and Amy found. Uh, another angle that we were 
uh, able to look at was variation according to region. So within any topic or code, we can isolate a particular region and look for trends uh, within that region as compared to other missions. So for example, in the case of trade facilitation, we see in East Africa many more projects that are focused on standards and practices surrounding livestock health and pastoralism, whereas in Asia there was more of a focus on fisheries and labor rights, or in Latin America uh, on pesticides and compliance with U.S. food safety laws. And in a similar vein, we can compare projects by the common challenges that they face. So as Justin showed, there's a specific section in each performance narrative for projects to describe their successes and challenges. So for regional trade, one of the crucial factors was, unsurprisingly, a strong partnership with national governments. And uh, another was the quality of the data collection that they were able to obtain through their local partners. But some of the most compelling results came from trends that appeared in the narratives that weren't necessarily captured in those 17 codes that we applied. And a good example of this is that increasing access is increasing access to market information. Uh, this was a topic that appeared in nearly every region, and we identified at least six programs conducting activities explicitly focused on increasing market information. And what I mean by that is uh, projects that are publishing information about prices, about imports and export flows, uh, technical guides for products, um, and, and often publishing these through online platforms. And so this is a trend that we might not have necessarily identified if we weren't able to search through all of these regional programs as a whole uh, simultaneously. So moving quickly on to uh, our analysis of the markets programs. So recall that the first thing we wanted to know was just how many market-focused projects are out there. So looking at the 2015 performance narratives, we included this time not only the regional missions uh, as we did with trade, but also uh, all the Feed the Future focus countries, BFS, and all the aligned missions. Uh, and we found that in a single year, there were over 160 programs that incorporated some aspect of markets, whether that be strengthening value chains or enabling trade policies or conducting economic research. And once again, similar to the trade analysis, we were able to highlight notable successes and challenges that were described by these projects. And the second half of this task was to identify potential case studies for particular themes to be discussed at this market flea. And one of those themes was creating enabling environments uh, that expanded market activities and, and, and reliability. Um, so to complement this discussion on enabling environment, um, I thought I would just quickly highlight some of those projects uh, that we identified. Um, once again, uh, our findings really support Megan's and Amy's because you can see uh, a few of those projects um, are also featured in our analysis. So one, one thing that we were looking for in good case studies was programs that not only reported their successes, but also gave an explanation of how they got there. And so a good example of that was the, the Rwanda Dairy Competitiveness Project. Um, which was very successful in strengthening dairy markets in Rwanda because uh, they had such a strong uh, effort to get out social campaigns to encourage people to drink more milk and also uh, this process that had been proving their system for tracking farm level data. Uh, and another thing that's really helpful for sharing lessons across projects uh, is when the performance narrative gives a strong sense of the ideas that it has for the future and how it wants to improve. Uh, and so one good example of that, again for Rwanda, is the Trade Infrastructure Program, um, which uh, gives a good description of trying to anticipate future challenges and opportunities by taking into account the trade environment in which it operates. So in the case of Rwanda, they found that there's a large amount of informal trade, it's occurring across national borders, and it's often being conducted by women. So informal trade presents challenges in collecting reliable data, but it also presents some opportunities for interventions that address both trade facilitation and gender integration. So we don't have uh, time today to go through each one of these programs that, that we uh, found in detail, but you can see that there's a wide variety of projects here. 
Um, and the, the content of the projects are quite different, but they all have lessons to share regarding enabling environment. And it's exciting to think about the prospect of allowing these programs to learn from each other. So to conclude, I, I hope that what Justin and I have been able to illustrate is something of a response to one of the looking forward questions that Amy raised. Uh, and that's how do we do a better job of tracking both quantitative data and qualitative results for enabling environment reforms from these Feed the Future activities. And in closing, what I hope that you take away from this is perhaps, you know, less look about the, the ins and outs of, of trade and markets uh, from these analyses and more about the potential that this approach presents for managing the vast amounts of knowledge and lessons the Feed the Future projects are generating every year uh, and utilizing this learning to its full potential by making it more accessible and more easily shared. Uh, and so on that note of learning and sharing, uh, I think that we can open up the discussion and start taking questions. Uh, that you saw today, um, be sure to click on the event page link that you'll see over on your uh, on your left of your screen under resources. The very first link says event page, and uh, that's the place to uh, grab the presentation for today if you'd like to go back and, and look through any of the slides. All right, so we're going to open it up for Q&A. We encourage you to keep posting questions or comments in the chat box. Really, any question about what you heard today is fair game and uh, we'll kind of we'll go through some of the questions that we already received and keep our eye out for any additional questions that come in the chat box. All right so first off very early on there was a, a quick clarification question that I thought I'd throw out there which is what is meant by a custom single window? That was something that Amy mentioned in her presentation and um, a few people on, online weren't sure what that meant. Thank you, Patrick, for the question. And uh, I'm sorry for not clarifying at the time. There's a lot of information in there. And, um, uh, it can be easy to throw around terms without recognizing that not everyone knows what they mean. Um, so in short, a custom single window is a means of streamlining the customs process by providing a single entry point for all of the different documentation that's required to get a shipment of goods across a border. So traditionally, uh, an exporter may have to go to um, six or ten different ministries for different documents. Um, and this is a means of establishing a single entry point. Um, it can be either physical, an actual kiosk at the border, or it can be a virtual uh, an ICT system. Um, and uh, it also helps by reducing opportunities for corruption, um, and it allows uh, speeding up of the processing of the documents at the border. Anybody have anything else to add to that? OK, great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, we also had a, a somewhat broad question come in from Martin Markoff, who asked, what are, in general, the most important policy reforms that have to be undertaken uh, for the enabling environment reform to facilitate agricultural sector growth? So asking about prioritization, um, how, how to prioritize policy interventions relating to the enabling environment. I mean, you learn so much from this process. How do you prioritize? It's a hard question. Um, it is, you know, as we described at the beginning, the enabling environment is a system. Um, and it's, it's a system of laws and regulations and cultural norms that impacts on another system, which is the value chain process from start to finish. Um, and so there has been, um, it's a good question, because there has been a lot written about the theory of sequencing policy reform. Whether there are some areas of the enabling environment that are more, more fundamental than others and where you should start, um, I, I feel that th there hasn't actually been a, a strong theory advanced for which ones are the most fundamental. Um, we could probably point you to some resources if you're interested in more about what's been said on that topic. Um, but the short answer that I would give is that ultimately the answer might just be wherever there's opportunity. 
Um, there's a number of new policy reform projects out there that are um, adopting an approach where they don't have any specific uh, policy initiatives that they have to work on. It's more of a work on eight issues within X time frame so that they have the capacity to um, go out, work with stakeholders, figure out where the needs are, and, and engage where they can have the greatest impact. Um, that said, given that each one area impacts on another, even if you're doing that, you need to be cognizant of that and be trying to build the capacity of the stakeholders you're working with so that they will have the capacity to tackle other issues after you're done. And I just heard you use that word uh, sequencing. And you have a question come in. Have you done any analysis on sequencing of enabling environment reforms? But also, what exactly do you mean by that, by sequencing? So that would be the question of, you know, it, should you start by making sure you have a good foundation for the enforcement of contracts? Or is the primary thing making sure that your trade policies and trade facilities are um, Like I said, I don't think there's any concrete theory of sequencing. Um, if anyone else has, has read one and they think they have the answer, I would love to hear it. Um, but there is a lot of research on the topic. And, and we have actually, under our predecessor project, did some research in the area of seed policy with looking exactly at this. Is there more of a theory of change with the seed sector? Um, and you can go um, read some of that. I, I, I'm Ultimately, though, I think my answer is still the same, which is that you have to engage where, where you have political will and, and stakeholder buy-in. Great, thank you. Uh, why don't we jump over to a question for Justin. Uh, a question had come in from Patrick Bins. How do you calibrate your quantitative analysis of keywords and phrases from project outcome reports? Wordsmithing, for example, uh, with selected projects' quantitative accomplishments. That's a really, really good question. And obviously, this is, this is more art than science. Um, I would say with the performance narratives, the way that we got around that issue is when we would code under results that were arrayed across the uh, Feed the Future Results framework, um, we actually use deviation narratives. Um, and so deviation narratives, uh, basically when you exceed by 10% or you're um, below 10% of reaching uh, your standard indicators, you do actually have to report that and give a justification as to why. This became helpful for us in that we were able to um, look at results that were reported within the performance narratives and be able to cross-list it to see whether they uh, achieve their targets or not. So by doing that, we actually would use a one to five weighting scale in order to sort of uh, um, you know, denote that, uh, which helped us sort of blend qualitative with quantitative. Because in that case, we were basically coding excerpts in a quali qualitative way, but being able to use that weight to get a better sense of the story um, as to the results being uh, hit. Now, the other thing I would have to stress is that um, you know, besides the actual you know, feed the future standard indicators, we also had a variety of different other results that we included that were much more qualitative in nature, uh, policy for reform being one of them. Um, so, you know, it, initially when any sort of sort of uh, policy, say something gets drafted or adopted, um, and and that gets reported, we were sure to also tag that as a key result as well. Um, so that's sort of a, a little bit about the approach that we used in terms of blending the qualitative with the quantitative. And we, we still are looking to sort of refine that process moving forward. Great. Thank you, Justin. And as long as we are uh, on you, we had another sure. question come in from uh, Abelardo Rodriguez for the KDAD team. Yes, that's a familiar name. How are you doing today, Abelardo? <laughs> um, so that's a really great question. Well, here, right? Let's make sure that we oh, of course. Uh, ask the question. So sure. that since um, our main audience may not be able to see our little question list on the side. So what Abelardo uh, very shrewdly asked is based on uh, our coding structure, have we been able to come up with causal models for development uh, using deduce? And can we depict the theory of change based on the qualitative results and are these results congruent with what USAID has stipulated as theories of change? Abelardo, um, I would say that looking across um, and, and looking at all these different performance narratives, 
it is still or and 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 also performance evaluations it's tough to actually uh get too causal with anything i think what this has done more uh, this process has done has helped point to where feed the future um where there are certain gaps in programming um so i think one of the the gaps that certainly came up um you know across both the review of the uh evaluation piece and the performance narrative uh, is around resilience. Uh, resilience was an issue that, um, you know, looking across different, um, you know, aspects of Feed the Future initiatives work, um, ag productivity, for example, was was pretty strong. Um, but where there was more, uh, you know, more of a gaps is how to provide uh, Feed the Future style interventions for uh, the the extreme poor. And so that was certainly something that came up. So I don't think it's it's at a point where we have very clear and deliberate causal pathways. It's more of a better sense of us mapping, um, you know, the the width and breadth of what Feed the Future has accomplished and where it might want to focus uh, resources and efforts in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Justin. Uh, just as a reminder for everyone. Uh, the full report that has been addressed in this presentation today, uh, the link is posted right now in the chat box. You'll see it at the bottom. The analysis of enabling environment reform under Feed the Future. So if you want to delve further into this topic, uh, you will certainly want to check out that report. And just my own personal question, uh, the report, it might seem like a, a beast for some people. In terms of approaching it, um, what would you recommend for a Feed the Future project that is interested in uh, addressing the enabling environment? How should they use this report? What should they look at first? Um, you know, what, what are kind of the key pieces Excellent. to take a look at? OK, thank you, Julie. Um, actually, well, I didn't give any background on the actual layout of the report. So for those of you who have not opened it yet, it is a little bit of a beast, um, but a lot of that is in the annex. Um, so we uh, we did the synthesis analysis of all of the the, um, the projects covered, and um, that section is actually not very long. So I would I would strongly encourage that to be read in its entirety, and it goes through a lot of what we've talked about today. Um, also included in there is um, an annex with short summaries of each of the projects that we identified that had a strong enabling environment component. Um, so more information on uh, listed by country, by region, on what they did, what they accomplished, um, what were the dates of the project. Um, so that's an excellent reference resource um, going forward. And then there's also an annex that gives a lot more um, specific, country-specific details on those six methods of engagement. Um, so for example, if you were trying to plot out uh, what types of activities to do under your project, and you wanted to, to look at how other projects have engaged in these topics, um, that might be a good place to start. All right, thank you. All right, we'll just keep plowing through the questions that have come in. Uh, another question from Martin Markov. If you had five days going to a, a developing country, on what topics uh, will you or should you focus to improve the agribusiness environment? Do you have a, a checklist of sorts? <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, my initial response is you can't go do this in five days. There is no way. Um, you could go in and do some sort of an overview and, and the, the, um, the next short answer to this is yes, we do have a checklist. Um, so as a project, when we go out to do these kinds of uh, technical analyses, we are usually engaged to, um, to use a specific analytical framework. And there are a number of different tools out there for assessing um, the enabling environment for food security. Um, some are as short as five days. Uh, under the, uh, our predecessor project, the e-project, we developed something called the AgV snapshot, which is um, actually designed to be done in a week with the idea of just going in, doing a, a desk review, and um, doing an overview of some of the main issues in the country. Um, as a means of focusing further, later, deeper dive analysis. Um, however, more, more likely, uh, we are doing a more thorough review of all different aspects of the enabling environment. Um, and those um, can be somewhat um, 
picked and uh, you can pick and choose a bit. So uh, we usually act on demand from uh, USAID missions. Um, so they may have specific policy issues that they're most focused on. Um, and uh, this is also uh, uh, one one thing to keep in mind if you're going um, into a country. It's doing the background research, and one area of that is looking at what other um, data is actually out there on the enabling environment. Um, which brings me back to uh, the World Bank's Enabling the Business of Agriculture um, Index. So this is a relatively new resource. Um, the, um, the first uh, multi-country report just came out in 2016. There will be a new one in 2017. And it covers a, a lot of different areas of the enabling environment, um, providing data on the quality of the laws and the, the time, cost, and procedure regulatory burden um, on agribusinesses. Um, and it covers, at this point, I think, uh, 14 of the focus countries. Um, and will cover, by January of 2017, um, 18 of the current focus countries. Um, so that's also a good place to start to give you sort of a snapshot of what is the health of the enabling environment um, in the country. What are the, some of the key focus areas? But it's, that's not where you want to stop. And, uh, and that's where I say you, know, you really have to have the time to go do more of a, a root cause in-depth analysis of um, some of those more systemic constraints to understand and put those numbers into context. Um, actually, in your resources over on the left, you'll see something called a guide to enabling the business of agriculture. Um, that's something we put out this year as a, as a reference document for USAID missions and how to effectively use this new tool. Because it can be incredibly good, not only at giving you a, a quick um, analysis of where some of the key um, trouble areas might be, um, but it is also uh, because it's scored across different countries, it can generate a lot of interest from policymakers, a lot of buy-in and momentum for reform. Um, but you just have to be careful to make sure that you understand what is being measured, what is not, and, and do the extra needed uh, analysis to put that in context. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. All right, I think there's a question that Justin can address, at least in part, from Patrick Binns. Capacity building is a major objective. Do you track what in-country project staff do post-project completion? I'm thinking of folks who continue to work in the ag ministry, organize ongoing civil society efforts, enter private business and supply chains, et cetera. What, what happens after a project is completed, and how do you keep track of that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And and I mean, right now, as as you can imagine, with performance narratives for annual reporting, um, these are projects that are currently active. And so um, looking sort of forward and sort of after the life cycle of, um, of the project, it doesn't necessarily address that. Where we do actually keep tabs on capacity building efforts, though, is we do have a, um, well, we certainly have a, a capacity building code that we use within the performance narratives. But then we also have an entire subset of uh, beneficiary codes to understand really who uh, Feed the Future is interacting with. And so in that way, we're able to, to sort of keep tabs on you know, those um, within government, um, within the local government that's receiving some degree of capacity building. Or maybe it's the, the local ag research sector. Um, so we do have a way of at least keeping tabs of the current capacity building efforts that are being done. Um, but your point about being able to track sort of the long-standing impact is actually a really good one. And I think it's worth us trying to figure out how we might extract that information um, from uh, reporting organizations. Thank you, Justin. And to those of us who are, are still online with us, we ask that you uh, please consider taking our ending polls. These are some polls that help us uh, gauge what you thought about this, um, this webinar, what was relevant to you, uh, some enabling environment issues you've faced. Uh, this will help our presenters kind of understand our, uh, your perspective a bit more and help us plan future AgriLinks webinars. So please go ahead and take these polls while we uh, keep asking a few more of the questions that have come in. And if you have another question, please feel free to post it in the chat box. Yeah. All right. Um, Phil Stefan uh, joined us, and so I thought it would be great to uh, to ask Phil's question, uh, which is that those in charge of making formal laws, policies, and regulations, as opposed to informal customs, practices, and traditions, may be personally persuaded by analysis of the costs of poor incentives 
or counterproductive regulations, but have to keep in mind their own political futures and stakeholder interests, political economy questions. What are good approaches to overcome reluctance or resistance to improve enabling environments in that case? Do you have any commentary on that question? I can um, start. This is funny. Um, thanks, Phil, for the question. And uh, you mentioned political economy. We, we've kind of been talking around that concept for most of the presentation. Um, Amy uh, recently talked about or uh, responded to, to a question related to sequencing and prioritization. And it's often some of these factors that you're mentioning um, related to political economy that um, help us understand what the opportunities um, are. Um, you ask, what are the good approaches to overcome reluctance and resistance to improve enabling environments? I, you know, I would have to turn. I would turn that question back to to those um, to the participants to to bring to bear some of their personal experiences because I think that's where um, where where we're going to learn the most. Um, but I just want to um, thank you for noting the importance of political economy and also um, indicate that. Uh, Feed the Future uh, acknowledges the importance of political economy analysis. And in fact, if it wasn't apparent, uh, many of the tools that we've referenced are, in fact, um, variations on political economy analysis. So, um, so thank you. Thank you, Kelly. All right. Um, a comment that came in from Dudu Nidaye I thought was uh, worth bringing up and allowing uh, the presenters to comment. I agree with the importance of market information systems, but according to my experience in West Africa, most of market information systems uh, work under support from projects and the system falls down at the closeout of these projects. The sustainability of these market information systems needs to be assessed. So this is a question about sustainability. Is that something Megan can start chiming in on? Sure. Thanks, Julie. Um, and this is a great question, Dudu. I think the um, one thing that this does raise is kind of the importance of actually tracking and monitoring progress on activities at a different level so that we know, um, for instance, how well this market information system is functioning um, not just in some of the out traditional ways, but also getting a better sense of the, the level of public and, and private investment engagement so that the project can ensure that the strategies that they're working on are supporting um, these very foundational um, actors as part of that system. So I think it also actually raises a really interesting um, assessment question, as you say, about what types of information are we tracking? And being able to track funding, um, human resourcing, and different aspects that, that ensure success of, of these important um, project efforts is, is key. Um, but I would also be very interested to hear how others that might be working in market information systems do some of this um, while they're building up these systems. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. And there was a question that came in really close to the beginning of the presentation, actually, uh, from Dick Tinsley. But we thought we'd bring it up again just for some clarification. Um, so Dick said that, I noticed that you uh, are talking about how our enabling environment concentrating on host country administrative issues. But how many smallholder farmers operate completely independently of any government contact? Um, perhaps as many as 90%, he suggests. Are you overlooking the operational environment that will enable the, the farmers to expedite their crop management? So how is enabling environment defined in terms of smallholder farmers who maybe don't have a lot of interaction with some of these reforms and policies? Sure. Um, Dick, I'm really glad you asked that. And I see that uh, Nate Klein, our chief of party, chimed in in the chat box to answer in part um, relating to the fact that in, the enabling environment includes much more than just the administrative rules um, and, and the formal rules. It also includes the informal customs um, that affect transactions at all um, levels of the value chain. Um, but what we get this question a lot. 
Um, and, and part of what we were trying to convey at the beginning with that uh, graphic of the value chain is that smallholders don't operate in a vacuum. Um, it may be true that they operate informally. Um, they don't have much interaction personally with, with government officials or with, um, with uh, regulations specifically. Um, however, because of the, the rules that impact those further down the chain, those impact the outcomes for farmers as well. Um, so where you have roadblocks um, that are increasing the cost of getting goods to market, or you have long delays at the border that are causing goods to, to, to spoil or, not, or causing you know, tremendous post-harvest losses, those things ultimately affect the price that the farmer receives um, at FarmGate. Um, and another way to look at it is that the way in which the rules are structured can determine how wealth is distributed within the system. Um, so where um, competition isn't well enforced, um, that can impact the price that the farmer receives. Um, and, and even as broad as where um, there isn't strong regulation of intellectual property rights um, for inputs, things like seeds, um, that can impact the access that smallholder farmers have to improved inputs. Excellent, thank you. I think that's an important clarification and, and something to understand. All right. I think that we are going to uh, go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. We really appreciate all of the questions and comments that came in in the chat box. Um, we uh, want to be respectful of your time and um, encourage you to go ahead and delve into the report um, that was shared in the chat box on the enabling environment analysis. So I would like to go ahead and thank all of our presenters here today. Uh, Amy and Megan from the EEFS project, uh, Justin and Gwen from the KDAD project, and Kelly from the USAID Bureau for Food Security. Thank you so much for your comments and discussion of the enabling environment. I think this is a really important topic and a lot was learned from uh, these reports or these analyses. So we're going to keep the discussion going uh, through AgriLinks. Again, if you attended the webinar today, you will get an email with uh, the recording, a transcript, and any other post-event resources uh, that the presenters would like to share. So keep an eye out for that recording. And uh, so most importantly, thank you to our attendees. Without you, we wouldn't be able to continue this seminar series. So please uh, keep returning to AgriLinks webinars. Keep letting us know what you like and what you don't like. Uh, we are making sure that these webinars are appropriate for your needs implementing ag development projects in the field. So take care, all of you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the month. Happy Halloween. And uh, we'll be back with another webinar in November. Thank you very much. <laughs>